Welcome to the Friends of Lake Quantipaut Annual Meeting Public Forum. With the Town of Wakefield committed to improving the water quality of Lake Quantipaut, tonight we have both a timely and topical presentation on lake ecology and environment. We are honored and pleased to have Dr. David Mitchell with us tonight. Just a few extracts from his extensive professional biography. Dr. Mitchell holds degrees from Brandeis University, University of Oregon, and Cornell University. His area of expertise is aquatic ecology and ecological risk assessment. He is professionally certified as a lake manager by the North American Lakes Management Society and is an adjunct professor at the University of Lowell in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, where he teaches a course in limnology, the study of lakes. Dr. Mitchell is a senior associate scientist at ABT Associates in Cambridge. He has over 25 years experience in environmental analysis, ecological impact assessment, and resource management. Dr. Mitchell has worked on water quality, nutrient criteria, ecological restoration and monitoring projects, sediment assessments, and water quality policy and permitting throughout the United States. Before I turn it over to Dr. Mitchell, I'd like to thank Karen Fahler for her tremendous amount of work in putting this program together for the Friends of Lake Quantipowit, and all board members for supporting uh, these information sessions. Dr. Mitchell? Good evening. As my name is Dave Mitchell. I'm very pleased to be here, and I want to try to convey in my talk tonight a little bit about how lakes work, and then to apply some of that knowledge and concepts to Lake Quantipaut to give you guys an idea of how the lakes might be working and some of the challenges and issues that are there. First, I do want to thank, again, the friends of Lake Quantipaut for having me. I want to think, especially uh, thank Tom Stapleton, WCAT, and Karen Failer, who again arranged all of this. Uh, Karen was so nice to actually even send me one of your f newsletters. And I opened it up and I saw a noted limnologist to talk, and I was dying to see who it was, and then I realized it was me. The uh, challenge I told for Karen is that, again, I do teach limnology as a, a, a college graduate course, and the idea to condense it down to one hour in terms of doing all this is quite a challenge. So I'm not going to try to attempt to do that, but I do want to do convey some of the kind of the basic concepts and some of the things that you may be looking at in terms of, if you're on the subcommittee, in terms of looking in terms of how you might assess the lake and its um, context is, you, again, you're looking to do some restoration on the lake itself. So the presentation tonight will basically be split in two halves. I put them in terms of a number of themes, but the first half, again, is to go through some of the basic concepts and general science of uh, lake science. And again, limnology, it, my cocktail explanation is limnology is like oceanography, except it's for fresh waters. So that's, again, that comes from the Greek limnos. Second half, I'm going to apply some of the um, concepts and features from the first half towards Lake Quantipaut, again, to give you some feeling for, you know, instead of having a concept in general, you'll have it in a specific in terms of a lake and water body that you know and love. Doing that, though, I have to pro uh, provide a large caveat. I am not personally familiar with Lake Quantipaut in the way you are. Um, I haven't swum in its waters, I haven't sailed over its surface, I haven't sat down and had a cocktail and watched the sun go down over its vista. So again, you are more the experts than I. All the things I'm going to be talking about tonight are basically from the data that's publicly available from over 30 years of research and studies that have been done on the lake. But again, I'm somewhat similar to a doctor who might be asked to read a patient's file to give a different opinion upon the lake. Um, as I said to Karen, though, again, given this, the subcommittee's um, uh, purview, I'm not going to try and make suggestions at this point. But again, I will just provide some of the, the ideas and challenges they are facing. Lakes do matter to people in a number of ways. Um, from my viewpoint as an aquatic ecologist, these are physical, chemical, and biological resources that uh, provide tremendous amounts of habitat and biological diversity and, again, a real natural landscape feature. Lakes have also been traditionally uh, a form of a utilitarian source of water, 
of power, uh, navigation, irrigation, and in some cases, industrial processes have used that. So we've used those waters. And then the way that most people around, I think, Lake Quantapout is the use of that as an aesthetic or a recreational feature. It's a real feature of the town. Coming into the, to the town, you, you cannot escape it. Um, if you go, I, as I was in the parking lot just a little while ago, it's just covered with people or cars, people jogging, people using the ball fields, people fishing. Um, again, something that gives a real sense of place to the town of Wakefield. Now, in terms of looking at lakes in New England, I'll go back and diverge a little bit in terms of where most of the lakes um, are, how they're, they're formed. Um, there's a noted limnologist called G. Evelyn Hutchinson of Yale. He, in one of his major treatises on limnology, describes 76 different ways in which lakes can be formed. I'm certainly not going to try to do that tonight. But what I want to go over is some of the main forms that in New England where the process by lakes were formed. Again, glacial activity. Um, and I've got some examples up there, Lake Winsinemon. These are, these are, I'll repeat things when they're a little bit so small, particularly for our TV viewers to see that too. But some of the Cape Cod uh, Kettle Hole Lakes, anything where glacial activity led to erosion, deposition, over deepening of river valleys, et cetera, many, many different ways in which glaciers uh, were responsible for lakes in New England. Another major one was us, man-made water bodies, uh, water supply, Quabbin Reservoir, Wachusett Reservoir. Uh, if you're familiar with Quabbin, you realize that to give the people of the city of uh, Boston a drink of water, they had to drown four towns. So thinking about what the environmental impact statement would be like for something like that today is kind of <laughs> impressive. But again, the other kind of thing that you're also familiar with are hydropower, I'm sure. Essentially, back in the in Industrial Revolution, there's a major source of, of hydropower in terms of the mechanical sense, and more lately, hydroelectric power. Uh, the Saugus River has a long history of hydropower going back to grist mills and ironworks downstream from the 1640s. So again, man came upon these um, natural sources of energy and have been harnessing, again, for his purposes for many, many years. Um, as we are advancing in terms of returning and restoring some of these rivers, you'll see in places they're trying to take out these low-head hydroelectric dam hydropower dams with the idea of allowing some of the anadromous fish to come back, the alewife, um, herring, et cetera. Uh, that's it. Something. The other kinds of activities we can talk about, shoreline activity, the, the shifting of sands. If you ever look at Cape Cod, a map of Cape Cod, you realize that many of the lakes in the bottom were cut off by the movement of sand. Riverine action, oxbow lakes, like you find in Northampton along the Connecticut River, where former bends of the river were trapped and had become lakes themselves. And lately, small level beaver activity everywhere. Um, again, something that uh, in my, my courses of uh, aquatic studies in the beginning of the late 1980s, where beaver were kind of scarce to the point now where they've become almost urban pests in some locations. If we look at the uh, source of uh, the lake formation of Lake Quantipout, and again, it's glacial form, and it's a partial kettle hole lake. And that term may or may not be familiar to you. Again, a kettle hole lake is a, um, formed when the glacier, again, retreats and a big block of ice gets essentially trapped behind. And over years, the more material washes out, it becomes trapped and often it becomes buried. Eventually, when that melts, that becomes a kettle hole lake. Kettle hole lakes are kind of characterized by a simple um, basin shape. They're often circular. They do not have a lot of impoundments. And again, um, Cape Cod is full of them. There's many, many places here. Um, and again, if you look at the underlying uh, soils of the area as well, you can see a lot of it is, is glacial outwash plains. Quantipowd is also in the category in Massachusetts, we have this specialty called great ponds. Now, everyone thinks their pond's a great pond, but it really does have a specific meaning. Um, in Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 91, it, again, it, it states that as ponds pertaining, containing in their natural state more than 10 acres of land and subject to any rights in such ponds, which has been granted by the Commonwealth. The concept of great ponds goes back to colonial times. Um, the, uh, many areas along the shoreline you were, um, had ponds which received, again, anatomous fish, things like herring, uh, shad, et cetera. 
those were pretty valuable sources of protein to people who were not necessarily having, you know, a lot of success farming or just during the winter time. So they were considered, again, something that was a community access. So if you look back actually in the 1640s, there's kind of the, one of the first environmental laws in the United States where it said basically that if you didn't trample your neighbor's corn to get there, you had access to a great pond. And to this day, the Great Ponds of Massachusetts, there is some kind of public access. It may be very informal, a little you know, easement off of a roadway, something like that, but there is, in fact, um, some sort of public access. Uh, Massachusetts has about 3,000 named lakes and ponds. There's many, many unnamed lakes and ponds, but they have about 230 great ponds. And you actually can see a list that's on the website that's given there in terms of which towns have different. I come from Sturbridge, which has the uh, fortunate um, occasion to have six great ponds, either with wholly within the town or abutting it. So that keeps us pretty uh, active in terms of our monitoring. When we think about these basins, why am I stressing them? Because again, they often are a major determinant of some of the physical, chemical, and biological characteristics. I think you can think about it in terms of when people say, oh, gee, you know, this person's growing up because they have good genes. It's kind of almost like the genetic material, the background, the, the basal stuff that's there. The environment, uh, the climate, man's influence can change those things. But again, basins themselves tend to have um, some predictable characteristics when you look at different kinds of lake basins. And those kinds of changes was the nature of the watershed, whether it's flat, whether it is um, mountainous, flushing rates, we'll go into these terms, thermal stratification, how dissolved oxygen and the, the, the fish and other kinds of biota are um, distributed, and what I call ecological expectations. Again, what are the kind of, um, if this was, if this is, was an pristine uh, conditions not touched by man, what would you expect in this? Again, we do have a range of those. Not every lake was going to be the same. I give the example if we look at some sort of a large, very steep-sided basin that you're going to have much more productivity, that is primary productivity, um, particularly plants, than a shallow basin, simply because you're going to have such a quick drop-off and the light's going to go away and, and they're unlikely to have any kind of these aquatic vegetation or what, what's the term is macrophytes. Again, I'm afraid limnology is rampant with different terms. Um, they're somewhat specialized. And I want to go right now in terms of uh, describing a few of these terms uh, in terms of what I call lake metrics. The slide that's coming up right now, it'll be a little bit too small to read for most of you. So again, you can listen in terms of the descriptions, but these are the kinds of things when you're looking at a lake, when you're giving it its mugshot, if you will, in terms of characteristics you want to kind of no a number by, we would usually think of height and weight, complexion, eye color, uh, visible scars, those kinds of things. Some of the metrics we find important in lakes would be surface area, for one. Size does matter. Uh, the larger lakes are more significant landscape features. They're able to support more water uses, ecological uses and habitats, and again, generally um, provide you know, uh, more value to us. But not all, all big lakes have the same value. The shape of the basin I mentioned before in terms of how it's, is it a, a one central type of hole or is it a like a riverine system where there's many kind of branching areas? A lot of our reservoirs have that kind of uh, branching uh, shape to that. Shoreline development index. It's a technical term. It basically says the deviation from a circle. If you look at a pure circle, the shoreline development index be one. Why is it a useful number to quantify? Because the further away you get that, you get some feeling for how much shoreline interacts with the water. The more irregular the shoreline, often the more um, uh, soil, uh, land, water interactions. A lot of times more productivity. From a practical sense, more houses because, again, the shoreline is longer and you're not necessarily viewing. Um, we'll go into Lake Quantapod. Quantapod has a relatively low shoreline development index. It has nothing with not the, not the number of houses that are on there, but simply the uh, land that you would put things like that there. Uh, volume, the size, the, the, the amount of liquid within the uh, um, Basin is important, particularly if we're looking for something in a water supply. Obviously, that's something that would be very important. Or in the sense that we are using that water to perhaps dilute uh, some of the pollutants that may be coming off the watershed in terms of its ability to assimilate um, any kind of these pollutants. Um, the average or mean depth is one that is, is a pretty important thing to consider because that gives you some idea of 
again, the area in terms of where potential plant growth could be. Um, the shallower your mean depth, the more likely you're going to have rooted aquatic vegetation there, as long as the, land, the, the, the water is clear and you have some sort of suitable substrate. Um, if you have a mean depth that's like 25 feet down, that means you've probably got a very deep lake. And again, you're probably not going to have that same kind of issue in terms of um, aquatic weeds. Uh, one value that really is, is a very popular one is maximum depth. Everyone wants to know how deep their lake is. You know, it's like almost a bragging point. But really, in terms of a functional sense, it's quite really not, it's not that useful. Quite often, because the way a lake shapes and down to a cone, the actual amount of area when it, where that depth is so great is very small. So it really functionally isn't that important. But people make a big point of it in terms of knowing uh, how deep their lake is. And again, I've been told about the bottomless lake many, many times, too. Uh, the last term is uh, one that's called hydraulic residence time. Um, it's a scientific term. It basically, it's the average period of time that you need to completely renew the volume. If you can envision a bathtub, and a bathtub with a faucet on, that you'll let the faucet run and run and run, all of a sudden it starts to overflow. The question is, how long, if you were a water molecule, would you be from the faucet to the point you were all of a sudden flowing on the floor? So that's in terms of that. The reverse is the flushing rate. How many times, if you were to look at you know, this bathtub over an hour, how many times would you see that bathtub essentially empty its volume, either before the neighbors downstairs called you out on it, the water company shut your water out. So the flushing time basically gives some idea how long pollutants may stay into a lake, or in case of, um, or, or in terms of uh, flow downstream, how often, how quick that may come. Let me give you a little more graphic example of this. This is a bathymetric map of Lake Quattapallet. It's very colorful, but let me tell you what exactly it means. A bathymetric map is like the reverse of a topographic map. If anyone have looked at a USGS map where they have basically the contours with the various heights going higher, this is the reverse. Think about flipping it upside down. So what you're really going is from the surface going on down. So in this particular example, this is made by CR Environmental not too long ago, it's color coded. So this actually is the elevation that's going down. So the yellows and reds are obviously the shallower areas and then the shading into the, uh, the blues and then the deep purple. So that is your, about 11 feet right there too. So what can we tell from looking at something like that? Well, again, it's generally one central basin in the middle of there. We can see that generally there is uh, not too much constriction. There's, some, there's a little bit of you know, um, division between the south basin and the north basin because of the, uh, the, the cemetery, the point where the cemetery is. But again, not too much of a constriction, pretty wide. And then the um, other thing is in terms of looking at uh, the shallow areas. Again, this is where you are going to make these predictions about where your rooted aquatic vegetation would go, because simply it's shallow enough, it's light, it has a substrate. And then finally, we, we often look at the, the uninterrupted length of a lake. Uh, the term for that is fetch. It means a couple of things. It will describe, uh, predict you how, how high a wave can get on your lake. It's also a good reason why Lake Quantipowit is very favored for sailing, because you have a nice breeze, can get actually, you can actually go further in that. But in our sense, too, it also could be there could be resuspension of sediments in shallow areas where you have this wave action. So again, that's one of those characteristics of that. Another characteristic of lakes that uh, often comes up is, uh, I didn't have, hmm, let me go back one. That one didn't come up. <laughs> it's missing something. The animation's doing fine, but okay. Out of this, now you have to imagine you're seeing a lake basin, a deep lake basin. I, I have no idea how that happened, but the idea is in it, this time of year, maybe just when ice out is going, is a lake is all the same temperature. It's turning over. You may have that phrase, turning over. Um, it's going through an entire lake's uh, circulation. There really is no difference between top and bottom in terms of water quality, dissolved oxygen, et cetera. In deeper lakes, after a certain time, usually in New England, it is late May, early June, the ability, the sun starts warming the upper layers. And both the ability of the water body to absorb the heat and wind action tends to 
lead to a separation. So in some of the deeper lakes, you have this temperature thermal stratification marked by a thermocline, and you have an uh, upper layer that's warmer in the summertime called the epilimnion, and a colder bottom hypolimnion. Uh, okay. So that is a feature in many lakes. It is not, a la uh, I think, a predictable feature in Lake Quantipowit. And Lake Quantipowit is going to act more like, hmm, I'm missing something. Um, it, it'll have a, a temperature profile that's pretty much the same from top to bottom. Now, what I was going to show on this particular slide is some lakes I, I've seen in, um, in Sturbridge, where I do some monitoring there as well, where pretty much from top to bottom you have the same temperature. What's different in those particular things is the dissolved oxygen. So it is possible, one of the lakes, the dissolved oxygen is about the same all the way down. Another example is where the dissolved oxygen is very much lower in the deeper sections. So it's possible to have dissolved oxygen um, that is different from top to bottom without the temperature being that way. And I think that's the case in terms of Lake Quantipowit. Another thing that kind of, um, kind of makes zones in lakes is light itself. I've kind of addressed that. Again, it, it decreases rapidly in, in water. And as it goes down, again, you can separate how far water um, uh, penetrates in the lake. Your monitoring group uses probably a Secchi disk to estimate the amount of clarity of the water. It's a very easy, um, easily made, easily understood and used, and it gives you an estimate of the clarity of the water. The clearer the water is, the more deep maybe aquatic vegetation could go. The terms we've got are uh, uh, photic, which is similar to being lit, and aphotic, unlit. I think more importantly, the zone of lake bottom where light can go, where the root of vegetation goes, has a specific term, and I'll refer to it a couple of times, called the littoral zone. I'll throw, uh, show you a um, uh, close-up of that in just a little bit. Again, but the idea being that in very shallow lakes, there is no aphotic zone. Light gets down everywhere. So if you have a lake three, you know, three to five feet deep, there'll be the potential for rooted um, plants everywhere. If you have a lake where it's 25 to 30 feet, there won't be plants. In New England, typically, um, we used to have to go on well, my um, lake studies of back actually a long time ago. We would do the aquatic vegetation surveys, and we would snorkel or scuba dive. And usually in most lakes we were studying, in urban areas in Boston, um, probably 15 to 12 feet, you pretty much lost the light. Now down in Cape Cod where it's clear, it might be 20 feet, but eventually you did lose the light. So again, um, and that again does limit the, uh, the length of your active zone. Here is the, as uh, shown going out from vegetation. This is the kind of the littoral zone in the vegetation. Why am I, you know, interested? Why am I talking about it? It's where the plants grow. And you've seen this all the time. If you've gone out and looked at your lake, in a lot of areas you have emergent plants. Think of your cattail areas. Or unfortunately, Phragmites is getting in a lot of areas too, but cattail areas. And those are called emergents or immersed plants. Then you have your water lilies, the floating leaf, the ones you could, which are rooted below the surface of the water, but which are floating. And then finally have the um, submerged aquatic vegetation. Those are things which are fully below the water, although they may send up uh, uh, flowering shoots from time to time. But again, in terms of lake usage, some of these times these things can get to high enough densities to be um, impediments. The other thing that's shown in little, is little dots in this thing is the, the algae or phytoplankton. That's, when I refer to that, it simply is the microscopic plant material that floats, single-celled or multiple-celled chained, essentially is the photosynthetic link uh, for a lot of things. And that's in competition because even though, you know, light's available, if you have a lot of um, algae in the water, your secchi disk transparency depth will be relatively low. And at the same time that's low, that means that the submerged plants are getting less light. So often you have in lakes that are very turbid, a kind of a reduced area of um, wetland, uh, of, of submerged vegetation. Um, sometimes when people clean up the water, one of the big surprises, where did all these aquatic weeds come from? We never saw these before. So again, if you again have the light and the availability, they'll probably be there. 
If you look at the open water area, you can think of again, an aquatic food web. I'm an ecologist, so I'm very much interested in the connections between the various compartments. You're too small to see there. But basically, we look at things like what's on the very bottom. The term for that is the benthic or benthos. These are the things that live on the bottom or association with the various um, plants that grow there. We also have the microscopic phytoplankton and then the things that people are not so aware of called zooplankton, animals, small animals that float in the water and are often are important grazers of the phytoplankton. One way of reducing the phytoplankton increasing the clarity of the water is to have a very healthy zooplankton. Where they also come is they're an important food link between your usually, you know, your smaller fish. This is a little bluegill. You know, it could be, again, in that food chain, they, they often have an um, important link. So we seem to know more about the phytoplankton and the fish in Lake Quantipout and not very much about the benthos and the zooplankton. And all those things need to have at least a little bit of information about them. Because again, they are connected and there's ways of biomanipulation that actually relies on uh, shifting to one uh, balance to another. Okay, I've got now on the other side of the equation, sometimes the more important one is the attributes of the watershed. Now the attributes of the watershed, again, for the people who do not have 20-20 vision with <laughs> or 40-40 vision or whatever that would take, um, the area of the watershed is an important factor in terms of how large an area drains into the lake. It pretty much can include both the surface water and groundwater. In some cases, there's almost no surface, apparent surface flow, but groundwater could be flowing into the lake. And it also determines how much of the flow and the timing of the flows. Tributaries, you understand, these are the um, water bodies that flow into the lake that can be permanent, they can be seasonal, they can be sometimes only active during storm water. Uh, storm water outfalls are what we call the actual pipes. Uh, there's kind of a general overland flow that occurs just from, say, a, a lawn area into the lake, and there's ones that go through a conveyance system that eventually gets delivered into a, um, a pipe. And again, storm water outfalls are always something we'll be talking about with Lake Quantipot because of the nature of the watershed. Uh, land use composition, um, the amount of percentage of the watershed is which in a particular land use is really an important way of evaluating the potential for water quality issues, and the watershed to lake area ratio. Often a, a higher watershed to lake ratio means potential issues for water quality because as the larger the potential land you're draining towards this, the more potential for some loading. So generally some of their more uh, polluted lakes have like 50 to 1, 100 to 1. It, that becomes a little bit difficult in terms of any kind of watershed management to do it because again, it not only crosses quite distance, often it's in different towns and even sometimes states. So stormwater is an issue and again, you, this is a um, Thunderstorm I caught, it was in Cape Cod, and you can see that it's coming down very hard, and you can see the almost the waves starting to come down as it comes down this, these blacktop, or what is often called impervious surfaces or impervious cover. Basically meaning it can't lead to any kind of absorption of the water into the ground, it just runs off. So any kind of uh, roadway roofs are impervious surfaces, uh, driveways are impervious surfaces, so those all can contribute in this way. Obviously, the water goes nowhere, it flows off. The little, uh, the little sign that you can see says Lakeshore Lane. <laughs> so guess where this water's going? <laughs> um, another example of this in terms of the importance of land use, and this is a little graphic here, and again, I'll try to describe this. There's a series of kind of showing the land uses on tops with an imaginary funnel. And then the pink is the little numbers here tell you roughly how much of the water is being uh, run off. It runs off from that surface. So at the very extreme, you've got dense uh, plant cover. And basically, only 2% of the water that hits the surface, say, of a densely forested area is going to run off, which means 98% goes to groundwater recharge or an aquifer, pretty important in some areas in terms of making sure that their water supply is kept um, active. As you go to decreased vegetation and, in, and increased amounts of bare land, the amount of water that runs off goes up pretty remarkably. So by the time you're getting into uh, poor uh, land quality or bare land, between 70 and 85 percent is running off. Another way of looking is see how much water is getting in the beaker. And then of course we get to a very urban area where it's 90 to 100 percent 
it all goes. It all goes into it. So again, we have to be um, cognizant of that in terms of uh, how we um, plan, plan you know, as much as you can do in terms of planning where our land uses are. In some cases, like the uh, Lake Kwanapat watershed, most of it's been developed already. So the, the choices are, are more limited. Uh, water quality impacts. Um, again, there's a variety of different kinds of impacts that can occur. This is kind of a generic um, uh, figure, but again, it shows the potentials for uh, different kind of sources of um, pollutants from man or within the lake itself to affect the water quality. And in this particular things, urban runoff would be uh, something you got, uh, Lake Quantipot would have to be, have some current with. Recirculation, resuspension of the sediments, uh, possible for some internal recycling. And again, just generally, it doesn't show here, but our, uh, deposition, just having rainfall or dust. As I was looking at my car today, I don't know what, we got a little rainfall and boy, did it get pollen all over it. I don't know, but you know, that's a case of the deposition. You don't, don't think it usually in terms of being happening when it's not raining, but it occurs all the time. Uh, we also have uh, waterfowl and pets are another sources as well. And again, um, it's not surprising that you, in this case, you know, you have potential for making a case of an algal bloom. So as we see these kinds of watersheds, we see the amounts of chemicals, and particularly plant-promoting chemicals, nutrients, kind of like the same stuff that comes in the fertilizer. Uh, if you look at your fertilizer bag, it says NPK, generally, in terms of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. For some reason, aquatic systems don't care about potassium, but they care a lot about nitrogen and a lot about phosphorus. So those two are very critical in terms of the ability to promote plant growth that is phytoplankton growth, aquatic vegetation growth. Um, and this concept, again, leads to um, the idea that as lakes become more productive, they kind of age. I'm kind of jumping a little bit. But one of the concepts is called the eutrophication concept. Again, I'll, people will talk about a lake being eutrophied. Essentially, that means is the lake is becoming overly productive. And the idea is that the natural sequence of the, the lake is that and this is a hypothetical idea, the idea that initially, say, after a glacial activity, you have a pretty clean lake bottom, not much coming off the watershed, and it's fairly unproductive. And they show here by a few fish. As the watershed matures, becomes more vegetated, and rocks break down, there's weathering, erosion brings soils in, the, uh, there's a, a little bit of sediment gets into that lake. That sediment provides substrate for aquatic vegetation, and overall, the lake is a little more productive. And the process goes on. The, the logical con uh, sequence of this is that eventually, in theory, you'll end up with a kind of a shallow marsh. You know, or a wet, you know, some sort of a wetland because it'll filled in. Now, this is a theory in a sense because this usually happens naturally in the order of centuries. Um, so we don't, we don't see this in our centuries. Where we may have evidence of this is maybe in terms of series of lakes that are different distance away from where a glacier was. So you can see one that was formed maybe 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years, and looking at those kinds of changes. Um, some places, Lake Superior will never become a wetland. I mean, glaciation will occur again before we have a chance for that to happen. So again, this process is, again, in terms of the lake aging or ontogeny. Now, if we put man into that, that eutrophication concept goes one step further. And we, rather than you show you different and call those, you know, the half-filled lake and the empty lake, uh, people have come up with a term in terms of trophic state. It's a general term that kind of describes the overall nutrient productivity status of a lake. Um, we have things which are poorly fertilized. That very early lake with, didn't have much runoff and, and, and very clear water would be considered oligotrophic. That's, again, jargonese in limnology for a poorly fertilized lake. Clear water, less algae, less aquatics. You then go to moderately fertilizer, and the term is mesotrophic, and then to excessively fertilized, where something has, say, a sewage treatment plant putting uh, nutrients into that. Um, that will be, again, uh, lead to a eutrophic uh, uh, situation. We showed you before the natural sequence of that. Well, let's talk about the unnatural sequence. When man comes in in terms of really leading to increasing of nutrients and sediments being greatly increased in the lake through agriculture, 
through unwise um, land development, um, through maybe stripping of the topsoil, all those kinds of things, leads to a quicker sequence. So things that might have taken centuries are now going in the order of decades. So these are things where you can actually see lakes in the Midwest where they had a lot of erosion stuff be essentially wiped out within 20 years, in the 1940s to the 1990s or something. Look at aerial photographs. And again, so much has come in, or they've had to dredge them out. So it compresses this, now, this eutrophication sequence from hundreds to, or thousands of years down to decades. But unlike natural eutrophication, what the basis of lake restoration is on is it's reversible. So there's many examples in the history of lake restoration. A good example is Lake Washington out in near Seattle, where for many years they had a sewage treatment plant going in there. And they saw the lake get progressively cloudier and more algae, et cetera. They just took the rerouted and took the discharge and took it out of the um, uh, Lake Washington. And they show almost immediate restoration of that, changes in communities, reduction in terms of a phytoplankton and greater clarity. The other side, of course, is it went to Puget Sound, which is now showing some signs of eutrophication. So again, it has to go somewhere. So the question becomes often where, where's the best way to do that or whether you have to make choices over that. The last uh, scientific uh, jargon I'm going to give you tonight um, is how would you identify trophic states other than me saying it mesotrophic or eutrophic. And this is a um, trophic state indicator that a uh, limnologist named Bob Carlson came up with. Again, too small to see, but it basically rates the lakes on the basis of three different factors. And these are factors you probably would consider, if you th thought about are appropriate. One is your transparency. So the actual secchi disk, if you go out and measure the secchi disk, the deeper the secchi disk goes, the clearer the water, the more likely you're going to push it towards the oligotrophic lake. Another thing they look at is the chlorophyll A concentration. Chlorophyll A is the primary photopigment. So when you're looking in water and getting the concentration of chlorophyll, you're really getting an estimate of the biomass of the algae there. So the greater the biomass of the algae, then the more likely the lake is to be more turbid and, again, tend to be more uh, eutrophied. And finally, phosphorus. Phosphorus is often in freshwaters. About 90 percent of the lakes, uh, freshwater lakes, are pretty much limited by phosphorus. That term limited means it's the, it's the scarcest element. It's the one which you supply, there'll be an immediate response to. Um, why phosphorus and nit nitrogen? Because in terms of the plant's needs for the various elements, it needs 15 times, uh, pardon me, the, it needs uh, typical concentrations of 15 parts nitrogen to one part phosphorus. It means that the phosphorus is usually responsible in terms of if you fertilize with nitrogen versus phosphorus for 10 to 15 times as much plant growth. I perhaps not explain that correctly, but it, it tends to be a more powerful way of doing it. Um, so that's good for us because phosphorus is a little bit easier to control than nitrogen. Nitrogen comes from many areas, including the, the atmosphere, by, by um, some nitrogen fixing. So this is a, a complicated slide. This is a simpler version of the same thing. This shows, again, another type of show. This is a different system, same concept behind that. But the idea being is that you've got basically a gradient of conditions that you start, you know, and, and there's not, and I should say that there's not like a good, you know, what's the best condition? Um, people sometimes think that oligotrophic must be the most desirable. Well, it's, it, it gives you clear water, but if you're going to go there and fish, you may not find much there. If you're going to try and, you know, have a, a balanced ecological um, habitat, you may not find it there. Some of the clearest lakes I know were the acid impacted Adirondack lakes, where nothing was growing. So again, people tend to think about that, though, is in terms of water quality. We definitely don't want to go in the eutrophic. Again, what characterizes uh, oligotrophic are low nutrients, decreased algal growth, and increased water clarity, and just the opposite for high nutrients, increased algal growth, and decreased water clarity. Where most lakes in Massachusetts would tend to like to be is in that intermediate um, because often that, that can 
That's my own bias because that allows fishing, that allows a ecological habitat, the water quality is good enough to support swimming, fishing, et cetera, that kind of thing. So um, that's again something that when you're looking to do restoration of that, you're often looking at how much phosphorus you can remove and then using predictive models to see how much reduction you might see in chlorophyll, how much reduction, how much increase you might see in secchi disc to see how much you actually have to get to where you want to get to the desired uh, trophic state. So the hard science is over for a while, so that's probably good news. I want to focus down on Lake Quantapow and again, apply some of those concepts towards um, the, uh, the lake itself again because that's the one we're here to really talk about and that you guys are focusing on in terms of what you want to do next. And here's its, its, its metrics. Um, it's 250 and this is, uh, you can't see this, but I'll, I'll leave this. I'm sure leave the, the PowerPoint will be on the website or something like that at some point. But anyway, these are the values I've gotten, and these are the sources. So there's a bibliography of various sources that we've gotten this for. So um, 225 acres, again, we talked about the Bayesian shape as being simple and elongate. That shoreline development, 1.34. It's a pretty much a rounded lake. And I, I'm sitting there in the park. And you can just about see about almost everything. So it's pretty circular. Um, mean depth is 6.3 feet. So again, that tells you that there's a potential for a fair amount of aquatic weed growth. The maximum is 11.3. So that would be, it would be considered a shallow lake in most considerations in terms of what we see. Um, the hydraulic retention time is about 220 days. That's how long water stays in there on average. And I should say on average. That looks at a yearly. It doesn't stay there all the time. It often flows a lot faster in the wintertime and or perhaps when there's a storm. But there's many times in the summertime, particularly you have two or three weeks without a lot of rain, that water is going to stay there. So that's one of those considerations you have to do, particularly when storm water often comes down in a large volume of water, and if it just stays there and doesn't get flushed through, then there could be an issue in terms of um, development of algal blooms. So the converse of the residence time of 220, about 1.8 flushes per year, so a little under two. The watershed is 459 acres, which leaves you with a one to eight watershed to land air, uh, surface area. Generally, that would be considered pretty good <laughs> in terms of the um, possibility in terms of in-lake management, but the other thing that's got to be considered is the land use composition. And again, based on, I guess, um, the original camp dresser, McKeon, actually looking at Massachusetts DOT looked at the watershed, it's about 70% developed in terms of the land. Uh, and 37% of the watershed is considered impervious cover. Now, in terms of what the desired rate for impervious covered, uh, Massachusetts DOT considers 9% to be what they'd like to do for BMP. So that explains, again, unless you're going to start ripping out <laughs> houses and parking lots, it's going to be very difficult to get that. Uh, so the watershed itself, again, shown here. And again, uh, this, this is a small screen, so I apologize. But you can obviously see the very residential um, nature of the watershed. This is just simply the, um, the picture. The watershed itself, uh, Wright Pierce, I understand, is doing some work for the town. So they've delineated more accurately the subwatershed. So these little areas which have separate numbers are individual watersheds for land that's draining to the lake. So they're looking at the various kinds of, that's the way you kind of have to treat this as a parcel by parcel uh, treatment. But again, the dominance of um, Interstate 95, 128, in terms of the nearness to the lake, 129, Gerald Spaulding, your yacht club, a very big cemetery. <laughs> It's a very big cemetery. Um, I don't know. They just seem that people like to come here to die, I guess. Um, <laughs> so peaceful. Um, and then your, your commons area down there. So again, it, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people, that, and they, obviously they love the lake. And again, it's an urban lake. It's an urban lake, which is nice in the sense that people can interact with it. They can walk two blocks and get to a lake. They can jog around the lake. They can take their kid fishing for uh, panfish there. Um, but it does come with a little bit of a cost in terms of the watershed it comes into. Okay. The water flow, this hasn't changed. This is from Camp Dresser and McKee. And it hasn't changed. This is from the 80s. But again, water doesn't change too much. It kind of shows you um, where the water comes from. 
the inflows, d direct precipitation about 37 percent, storm water about 44 percent. So the storm water is the big dominant. And then direct surface, things that don't go through a storm water pipe but just run off in the lake, that's about 17 percent. Not much in terms of groundwater. True kettle hole lakes like in Cape Cod, sometimes almost the entire inflow and outflow is due to groundwater. Where the water goes is primarily divided between the surface outlet, as it goes down to the Saugus River, and evaporation. That really counts for that. There's a little bit of outflow as well. Again, these things may have changed a little bit over the years, but again, hydrologic budgets tend to stay, you know, because the precipitation, unless you have major change in the precipitation or, um, I don't know, <laughs> the soils and storms tend to stay the same, so that probably is not too far off what it is today. Um, if we look at the status of nutrients, and again, going to the sources of, mm, didn't come through, okay. <laughs> um, what was there, and I can describe, basically a pie chart showing the various sources, and I apologize, I don't realize why the PowerPoint, which looked great on my computer, is not coming out so well on the, um, the big screen. But the uh, biggest sources of phosphorus in the lake are the stormwater and surface flow, between the two of those. They each have about 34% of that. Um, ENSER in 19, 2000 also suggested that there might be a, a component of internal recycling. What's meant by that is when the bottom sediments get um, anoxic, which is just a term for meaning they, they essentially go very low oxygen, there's a chemical reaction which releases phosphorus from the bottom. Um, I, I spend half a lecture talking about iron binding and all that sort of stuff in, the, in my limnology class. But just basically, you have low oxygen or you have no oxygen, there's a the potential for, uh, for phosphorus to be released and recycles. So the idea being that even it, um, it doesn't get flushed out, it tends to go into the water column when it gets mixed. It may go in the water column, become oxidized and fall out again. But again, it's a, it's a potential internal source. That's one of the things you have to consider when you look at lake restoration is your sediments, as you know, are kind of a legacy of what's been done in the watershed or the inputs. Um, for example, in Cape Cod, I was uh, doing some nutrient inactivation of really nice looking lakes, or at least very small lakes, very deep, um, but which had, you know, 50 or 60 percent of their phosphorus in the trophic state leading to like a eutrophic state due to internal recycling. I'm still not sure exactly where that came from. It could have been old cranberry bogs. It could have been agricultural. It just, it just in this, these lakes need to be very good traps for phosphorus. And unfortunately, once it's there, it's kind of hard to flush out. So uh, looking at the kinds of sources that waterfowl were more significant, I bet you have less waterfowl inputs combination of being more aware about that. And the other thing people forget, seagulls. Remember all the seagulls that used to be in lakes? When we got rid of landfills or capped them and better, we got, a lot of, we got rid of a lot of the uh, seagulls. So that's something that they probably don't see. I noticed a couple of resident swans. You probably have at least some Canadian geese stop by. But again, there's ways, as you know, Stop. By. Well, that's the, one of the things that's happened in terms of even my lifetime is we used to look and see them as relatively rare, and now about one third of Canadian geese don't go anywhere. You know, I, I, I go through a very busy intersection between 2 and 16 in the middle of the, and the, the, the there's one nesting, I swear, right in this little median, you know, I mean, it's just amazing. The second one that was going to show you, obviously, was the counterpart in terms of nitrogen. Here, the message is very simple. About 70% of it was from stormwater. That's a real source of nitrogen. One of the reasons being is things that like um, convert to nitrate. Nitrate is very soluble in water. It doesn't settle out like phosphorus does to, to particles. It's very hard to treat in terms of stormwater. So that often comes through a lot. Uh, I'm not going to talk about chloride is obviously an issue that comes uh, well from stormwater as well from the streets. Uh, in terms of where those that changes may have occurred from when the original budgets were done, um, some of the precipitation may have gone down from where they looked in terms of their time frame was in the 80s. Clean Air Act has actually changed and improved the quality of the air. And actually car exhausts burn cleaner these days too. So some of those sources of nitrogen probably have, uh, have gone down. But stormwater still seems to be a predominant. What this leads to, again, is in terms of potential for increased phytoplankton. And again, I put what I call kind of what I perceive as the concerns, and you can tell me how wrong I am, because remember, I'm not the expert in the lake, you guys are. But 
a lot of the concern is in terms of the blooms, where it discolors the water. I'm trying to change that. Uh, this is a little uh, water sample. You can see the water there, or the, the wonderful blue-green uh, algal bloom. Um, someone was mentioning about last year, if you look at Google Earth's um, satellite photo of uh, Lake Quantipout, it was taken August uh, 24th. And you can see a really significant blue-green algal bloom on the surface, particularly in the shoreline line on the eastern side. But very, it's got that, again, blue-green from it's got various kind of pigments to lead to it. Um, they're part of a natural lake cycle. Um, I mean, there's always algal blooms. There's an algal bloom going out there right now, I can guarantee. It's probably diatoms. It's part of the natural lake system is that when the lake gets light, in the springtime, nutrients are high. There's different kinds of algae that go through. But typically, you see the blue-green algae are a mid-summer to late-summer species. That's when you typically see them. Um, they tolerate shade pretty well, so they don't mind it if the water is pretty turbid. They're very good at scrounging nutrients. So if low nutrients, they can deal with that fine. And they don't taste so good to zooplankton, so they're not grazed as easily. And they often have some flotation in them, so you see surface scum. So they have found a very successful ecological niche in the conditions found in late summer, but also they have um, the, the ability to do a surface scum so you really see them. And particularly when they break up or lice, it looks like someone's thrown blue paint on the water. I don't know if you've seen that sometimes, where they really break down. You can really get, it almost looks like an acrylic blue. The other reason why we have concerns about them are what's called cyanotoxins. Those are basically, um, compounds within the algae that um, can lead to, if you ingest them or you expose them, can lead to some gastrointestinal di distress. They can lead to rashes. In extreme cases where cattle in Australia had no other place, they can lead to death uh, of certain kinds of And people have become more aware of them. The Massachusetts Department of Health now has recreational water thresholds. I think Don Heath was looking at that a while ago. Um, and Doug Heath, pardon, Doug Heath was looking at They have values for the cyano, uh, cyanotoxins, and that's just general form, but particularly microcystin, which is the ele active element from microcystis, which is a, a toxic form, and anatoxic, which is from anabina. So those, those are two different kinds of blue-green algae that form blooms and can lead to these kinds of um, exceedances, and it usually leads to either closing of the public beach and putting of health advisories, like not letting your dog, you know, have is drink of water from the lake, those kinds of things. The thing, too, uh, in terms of their formation, we also know that if you've got a very amount of rich phosphorus and not so much nitrogen, they, they do a neat trick, is that they're actually bacteria. They're not actually al they're algae, but they're not um, prokaryotic, not eukaryotic, small form. But they have the ability, some forms, of taking atmospheric nitrogen and using it as a nitrogen source. So nitrogen to phosphorus ratios are sometimes looked at. Lower n to p ratios can lead to uh, concerns whether they favor blue-greens or not. So that's just a little bit in between of that. That's a little bit. I don't have to go too much in that. In terms of the other component, um, aquatic weeds, um, Camp Dresser McKee did a macrophyte survey, but you know this is like the shoreline. I mean, this is like the way they used to do. They didn't actually get in the water. <laughs> <laughs> they basically did what they could either see or pull up with a rake because all we have is the information on the um, the shoreline. And it was obviously a wetlands person because we have there's a list of about 25 plants. Only three are actually in the water. Most of them are on the shoreline. But the ones that were reported are um, most common was Elidea, the water weed, it's a, a, a submerged, and then the two floating uh, water lilies, both the white and the yellow. Now. Um, EOEA came up with uh, one of the reports I found indicate that a non-native aquatic plant has been found there. I don't know if you're curly leaf pond weed. I don't know if you've seen this in terms of it's got. I, I say the leaves kind of look like crinkled French fries. Very prominent in the water column in June and July, and then dies off. It's a non-native species. Um, put them in crispus. But I really don't know much about the status of the density of the aquatic vegetation. I don't know if you guys, uh, if the friends, have done aquatic vegetation surveys or what, 
I kind of got the feeling, I'll say later, it seems that perhaps the concerns about that have been pushed aside or the fact that the water is more turbid now is you just don't have that, li that, that uh, amount of vegetation down there. In terms of doe, just having a non-native species too, you have to be very careful about that and um, worry about in terms of other things coming in because Potomacate and Crispus is one, but there's other ones like fanwort where you definitely don't want in. And so a lot of lakes go through some sort of a um, uh, rapid response and actually DEP uh, commends people to do this in terms of what happens if you get them hand pulling or herbicide, something very quickly because once they start to spread, and typically it's the boat ramp, ramp that's the first point of infection, it's very hard to stop them. Okay, let's, uh, kind of going towards the end, what, how things change. I've got 30 years worth of data, but if you look at the CDM uh, report and the ENSER report and the um, 2010 Massachusetts Integrated List of Waters. They've gotten a little bit jumbled here in terms of it. The concerns are pretty much the same. This is what they found in terms of, uh, you know, uh, 1980s and 1990s, aquatic weed growth, algae blooms, turbidity, and low bottom DO. Now, Massachusetts lists all its waters in terms of those not meeting water quality standards or water uses, 303D, 305B list for those in the Clean Water Act. But they basically identify what, what, what are impairments, what are things preventing water use. They've identified excessive growth, algal growth, non-native aquatic plants, turbidity, and DDT. DDT must be in the sediments. I don't know where the source of that is. That's, that they somehow got that. Um, but generally, the whole bottom line is general consensus is that excess nutrients in a certain amount um, uh, sediment are, are it's causing these, these uh, water impairments. So here's the trophic state model again, the same thing. The question is, is Lake Quantipout shifting towards a eutrophic state, bottom line. Some of the historic and recent uh, restoration, I'll call it reference, uh, there used to be phytoplankton control using algicides, using copper sulfate. Uh, arsenicals were used to treat vegetation control. I don't know whether, do you guys have a weed harvester at one point? Okay, I don't know how it affected, but again, it's like mowing the lawn. <laughs> Contaminated sediment. Yeah, a cat, a contaminated sediments. A large shag was of coal, residual coal tar, and that's you know that's a good thing, but doesn't lead too much in terms of changes in the lake. But it's good for in terms of avoiding human risk. And then finally, Massachusetts DOT looked at what they call the retrofit initiative for the I-95 runoff, and they decided that they didn't have enough land to put a BMP, so forget about it. They didn't do anything about it. Um, best management practices. So ENSER came up and did a pretty good job of reviewing it and, and CDM had things like a dredging and a berm. ENSER came up with some potential, a nice mixture of, of uh, watershed source management and in-lake management. So they looked at different kinds of BMPs, environmental stewardship, um, detention basins. They also looked at nutrient inactivation, aquatic plant. These were, they, they'd gone through this by screening. And guys, that's what your committee is going to do, is take a look at the laundry list of potential lake things and screen and say, is this appropriate for the, our lake? Does this give us the bang for the buck we want? And in terms of, just following up, in terms of environmental stewardship, you've really gotten a, um, you get, you get an A from me in terms of your efforts. You're doing all the right things. You've got water quality monitoring six times a year. You're doing these educational uh, pamphlets. Question about the reduced phosphorus fertilizer. You have watershed in doggy, <laughs> doggy bags. Um, you do the annual lake cleanup twice a year. Um, and you participate in the local watershed. Uh, uh, so in terms of what you're doing, get high marks in terms of what you've got. Now my current observations, again, uh, Concern seems to have shifted from the rooted aquatic vegetation to the algal blooms, particularly microcystis and abena. I think your watershed educational behavioral changes, whatever benefit you're going to get, you're probably reaching the limit of those. You know, you're going to know whether people will change or not change at this point. There's certain things you can do. Stormwater still likely dictates your ecosystem health, and you'll need to address that, whether that's done in one big step or incrementally, it depends. And then funding for the uh, large improvements, as you know, is always a big is issue about that. And some of the finally, in my last slide, challenges for the town subcommittee, what I, what I leave you with. Again, accurate assessment of the current lake status, most of the data is 30 years old. Um, 
it's important for the town to decide, you know, the committee to decide what has changed and what has not changed. So you'd have to evaluate the nutrient trends over the years. Uh, have they improved? The budgets still look appropriate that were originally done. Tracking this question about whether you have dissolved oxygen is a real problem or not, it's still not sure whether how big an issue that is or whether it's only in the deep hole in a small volume. Uh, investigating the causes and include the blue-green bloom uh, stag formation. And you're going to need to revisit the lake management toolbox. That toolbox is essentially the methods and various kinds of things. A very good introduction to them is found in the Massachusetts Generic Environmental Impact Review for eutrophication. I've got that and another um, practical guide on, on my end slides in terms of websites. They're downloadable. One is a compendium that's over 700 pages long. Everything you want to know about this in history, there's a practical guide. I would suggest that each member of the subcommittee get the practical guide. It's a very nice, quick compendium of the, um, the issues all in about 120 pages. Um, again, the only thing in terms of it, you're looking, you'll see more sophisticated and uh, specialized lake management tool, but again, specialized and sophisticated is not to be confused with appropriate and cost effective for Lake Wanna Power. And finally, what are the reasonable, what are your objectives? You've got to, at some point, what do you want to go for? When we, you know, what will you do that you'll claim victory? Is it because you'll reduce the, the frequency of blue-green algal blooms? Is it because you'll illuminate them? I mean, you, or, or you're going to just look in terms of the uh, certain water clarity you need to get to? So again, that's something that the committee has to do, and that will somewhat dictate the kinds of methods you consider in terms of what to do. And with that, I know I've taken a few minutes over, but I did want to leave you with some good news. And there's no zebra mussels in Lake Quantipout. <laughs> so, and with that, I will take questions.